welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us for the second installment of HipCamp's Project Monarch webinar series. We're going to start today by introducing our speakers. Uh, we've got Alyssa Rabazio here joining from West Marin. She is HipCamp's founder and CEO. Um, she's going to share a little bit about why this project's important, um, how HipCamp posts in particular are so well positioned to make an impact, um, and just share some of her thoughts on the Project Monarch um, initiative. Next, we have Phil Torres, who's joining us. He is a biologist and Discovery Channel host and a passionate butterfly enthusiast who's going to be sharing a little bit about the extraordinary life of a monarch butterfly from egg and caterpillar to migratory adult, uh, many of whom, many of these butterflies will be passing through hip camps on their way to their overwintering sites. Uh, next, we have Matthew Shepard, who is the Director of Outreach for Xerces Society. Uh, he's going to be sharing some important information about monarchs and how to steward an environment that supports them. And finally, we've got Charles Post, who's Hip Camp's resident ecologist. He's helped us build this project, and he's going to be talking about the conservation value of protecting monarchs and how Hip Camp Post, like you, have a unique opportunity to help save them. Finally, we'll wrap up with some Q&A. Um, you can use that, that Q&A function there. We'll be checking it throughout and we'll do our best to get all those uh, questions answered for you. Um, with that, Alyssa, if you'd like to take it away, I'll hand it over to you. Absolutely. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, uh, wherever you're dialing in from. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Alyssa and I'm HipCamp's founder, CEO. Um, calling in today from the homelands of the Miwok people, just north of uh, the Bay Area. And happy to share it is nice and foggy and cool here. I hear it's really hot where a lot of people are. So come to the coast um, if you can. Um, and thank you all for joining us. I know everyone has a million things you could be doing with your time and you're choosing to show up for the butterflies. And I think that is really special. Um, and let's talk about why. So I think as most of us know, um, we are in what a lot of scientists uh, would call a new geological era known as the Anthropocene. And as most of us also know, a quick Google search will confirm for most of us, this is not a good thing. Uh, we're seeing uh, a thousand rate, what we consider to be the normal extinction rate, uh, very dangerous level of greenhouse gases. Pollution is now responsible for one in five human deaths. And um, it's just not a great, it's not a great moment, I think, in a lot of ways. On the other hand, I think we have a huge opportunity to really change that narrative. And one of the things Charles and I um, really have connected on is the opportunity to make the Anthropocene a good one. If we're going to have an entire ge geological era named after humans, um, don't we want to kind of own that and make it a good one? Like, what can we do to really, you know, steward habitat, repair some damage we've done, and create a much brighter and better future for all of our descendants, both human um, and, and not. So that's really kind of the concept and the seed of a lot of both Hip Camp as a company and then um, this project, Project Monarch more specifically. Um, and sometimes people ask like, hey, you're a camping company. Why do you care so much about biodiversity in the ecosystem? And there's a couple answers to that. Um, a very personal answer is I'm just obsessed with butterflies and in particular the Monarch to me is just this really important symbol um, culturally. Um, of course, from a scientific perspective, uh, Charles and, and Matthew, and I'm sure Phil today have uh, have and will be very helpful in, in kind of validating this obsession and that pollinators really are, I think as a lot of us know, uh, foundational um, to every ecosystem on land. We really need them to support um, all the rest of life. And so they're a good place to focus. Um, I'm also someone who really um, cares about the cultural significance of these um, of these uh, insects, and in particular the monarch um, as this insect that goes, you know, all over North America, across these borders, across where we were supposed to have built a wall, across you know so many different cultures and languages, um, and have really different and really important significances in all these different areas, and yet are vanishing before our eyes. The New York Times, as um, I'm sure, ho hopefully most of you saw just last week, the IUCN listed the monarchs as endangered, which is great um, that we're getting that recognition. And the New York Times in that article reported that 99.9% .9 of Western monarchs um, have vanished um, just since the eighties. And so this is literally in my lifetime um, on our watch, we're seeing this beautiful species really you know, disappear right before our eyes. And so to me, the monarch stands out as a symbol of something that you know so many people remember being so abundant you know, trees filled with them all, all, all over the sky, 
um, so important culturally, so present in our art, um, in our in our films, in our uh, in our our museums, and yet disappearing on our watch. And so, to me, I think you know, as many of us do, expect our culture needs to make a big shift, uh, needs to make it soon, um, a shift towards a culture that really values nature, values biodiversity, understands if we don't support our ecosystem, who cares about the economy? It's not going to work anyway. Um, and to me, the monarch butterfly um, has every potential of being that moment and being that species that really um, helps catalyze this turning point. So um, the monarch is very important to us. Um, as a camping company, we want to make sure there are beautiful places to camp and get outside 100 years from now, uh, 500 years from now, and we have to take care of our ecosystem to do that and to create that. So that's why we're here. Um, I'll also share that Hip Camp's core theory of change is when we get people outside, biophilia, which is all of our inherent love for nature, takes hold. Uh, we can't help but fall in love with the natural world when we spend time in it, and that people in general protect what they love. So by getting people outside, we're really creating the future generations and the future. I saw we had someone, uh, a nine-year-old joining. Um, we've got kids on this webinar, and so just so exciting to see that already happening um, but continuing to create the future of people who, who want to protect our beautiful natural world we live in. Um, and I know a lot of you joining today, not all of you, but a lot of you are, are hip camp hosts. And I think hip camp hosts in, in, in specific have an incredible opportunity to make a really big impact here. Um, you have land, so you have the opportunity to both create and steward habitat. You're also welcoming members of our community onto your land on a regular basis and therefore have this incredible chance to educate people. Um, about what it means to take care of habitat and support ecosystems and pollinators. Um, you also have the choice um, to abstain from destructive pesticides like glyphosate. Hopefully we'll talk more about glyphosate today. Um, also wanna recognize if you are using glyphosate or, or on land that's been historically using glyphosate, it can be really hard to stop using glyphosate. Um, and we wanna talk about that um, and, and support you in that journey to get off of pesticides that can be harmful not only to pollinators, um, but to all of all of our health. Um, and so by participating in this program, by being part of this pollinator program, we know you're doing more uh, than the government requires of you. We know that you're stepping up to do your part and leaving it better and creating a better future. Um, and so from hip camp standpoint, that means one, we wanna support you in that. We wanna bring together, you know, incredible experts like Charles and Matthew and Phil to really you know, educate and, and inspire and bring the best content and understanding we have of the current situation. Um, but we also want to make sure we're rewarding you financially. Um, and so what that means on Hip Camp today is we're going to be doing lots of promotion of any host that's participating in this program on our homepage and social media. We want people to go choose to camp with you first. Um, and down the road, we're also going to be um, supporting you with better ranking in our algorithm. So when people search for places to camp, um, if you are a participant in Project Monarch and, and supporting these values, we're going to actually rank you higher in our search results. And again, encourage more people to camp with you so you can make uh, more money and do more supporting of pollinators. So um, more to come there, but just wanted to share. We're you know, very appreciative of everyone putting extra time and extra effort into this. Um, and want to do our part to support you in that. If you're not a host and you're joining us today, there's still so much you can do. There's something all of us can, can do to support the pollinators. Um, so thanks for being here. Um, thank you, Remy, for organizing us all. Shout out to Remy, who's getting married in a few days and still doing an amazing job pulling this webinar together. Um, thank you to Charles, Matthew, and the Xerces Society, and of course, Phil, for joining us. Really excited to learn and listen this morning. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Alyssa. It's so exciting. Um, we're going to hand it over to Charles Post now. Charles, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much. I'm going to do a screen share. Slides. Let's see if we can get this to work. Okay. Is that uh, slide share? Can everybody see this? Is that okay? Awesome. Well, Alyssa, thank you so much. Your words are always inspiring. Uh, this group is inspiring. Remy, again, you're, I know you have such a, so many things on your plate. So thank you for pulling this all together um, with such style and grace. Um, and for all of you, thank you for being here. As Alyssa said, I know you're busy, busy lives. It's early in the morning, it's summer. There's a lot happening. Um, 
but we hope this time, uh, this time you find uh, well used. And so, as Alyssa said, I'm an ecologist. Um, my background is in food web ecology. I spent uh, nearly 10 years studying and working at UC Berkeley, looking at freshwater food web systems, uh, predominantly in California. And so, while monarchs weren't my focus, one of the things that we're taught to really hold reverence for and focus on is this, this truth that freshwater systems and us as humans are connected to the terrestrial systems, to the upper watersheds, and to the ridgelines. There are threads that bind us all. And so our, our choices, our behaviors, and habits have cascading effects. And the monarch is uniquely positioned because it, it may be the most well-known native pollinator in North America. It's on shirts, it's on bags, umbrellas, you name it, people probably recognize it. And so it makes you monarchs uniquely positioned to be a catalyst for change. And so just to jump in and cover a, a kind of a, a, a basic ecological term that I think you all might find interesting is this idea of an umbrella species. And on the right, for anybody in the West, maybe you're familiar with the sage grouse. Uh, it's a classic umbrella species, as is uh, the monarch butterfly. And what's so amazing about conserving monarchs in particular is that when monarchs are protected by default, countless other species in that ecosystem are also protected. So when you make decisions on your land, when you, uh, you know, adopt these practices that benefit pollinators and monarchs in particular, by default, you're making decisions that benefit the stream ecosystem, the watershed, the plants, the deer, really anything that cohabitates these places. And the wonderful thing about monarchs is they're migratory. So decisions you make are affecting a species that is flying, in some cases, thousands of miles. And so your decisions on your land have these trickle down effects that might benefit a family in another state, in another part of the country, in another part of the continent. And so umbrella species are really fantastic to focus on and prioritize because ultimately they do transform the conservation landscape in a region or in a, in a, in a municipality or on your property. And so this, Kind of sets the stage, right? Alyssa talked a, a bit about Anthropocene. It's often had this negative connotation. We're losing species. The, the collective swing of our acts is changing the face of our planet, changing the way ecosystems function, changing the way ecosystems are structured. Biodiversity is maybe has never been more at risk. One of the greatest things we can do for the preservation of biodiversity and for the preservation of our planet as we know it, is to set aside land for nature, to let nature be nature. And so this upper um, line is from National Geographic. The lower is of a peer-reviewed science paper that talks about imperiled species being most vulnerable on private lands. Why is that? That's because on private lands, the decisions the land management decisions are up to citizens where maybe a national park has federal guidelines uh, and limitations. Obviously, private lands are different. Um, there's a lot of options and opportunities to subdivide, to have land use changes, to use pesticides, herbicides, or to not. And so while this line from this paper does indicate the risk, there's also a huge upside. And so what we're looking at here, the things to keep in mind is look at the red and the yellow. These are areas where we're having high incidence of land use change. So places on earth where nature is being turned into something other than nature. And if you can kind of train your eyes on North America, we see a lot of places where that's happening. We're looking in the Midwest, we're looking in the inner mountain West, parts of California and the Central Valley. And so these are all places where land use change is, is taking place, where nature is being converted to something other than that. And so as hosts, as landowners, land managers, land stewards, by simply having your land as a hip camp, as nature, as what it was when you got it, 
you are turning the tide. You are slowing and curving the land use change, which is one of the single most significant drivers of biodiversity loss and nature loss on the planet. So that's a huge, huge win, like such a fantastic contribution to the future of our planet. And so when we think about this broader hippocamp community, it's pretty cool, right? Four million acres of working lands are within this, this hippocamp community. And if you look at that across, say, the United States, that's bigger than the state of Connecticut. And so that's pretty amazing. The choices that you all are making are influencing a substantial amount of work. And so again, like Alyssa was saying, the Anthropocene does not have to be filled with doom and gloom scenarios. There are so much opportunity for inspiration, for positive action, and for saving a species like the monarch. Because we have this chance, we've never been at a time where there's more access to information, where there's more advanced technologies and science and research that's available to inform us. And also we have this massive community where if we can work together and adopt practices and land management and land management strategies that benefit species like the monarch, we can truly leave a legacy behind where campers and our kids and their kids, generations to come, will be able to see monarchs in the sky, have clean air, access to, to the dark night skies, places to go swimming, all the things that we hold. So you are not alone. The headlines can feel isolating, the data can feel overwhelming, but just to look at this statistic and, and, and what's on the screen here, to me is incredibly inspiring. And it's just a reminder that we are truly part of the groundswell. This might be the, the, the slide I'm most excited about. Uh, my wife, Rachel, is an artist, helped us layer a few things. Xerxes had the map, Hip Camp had another map. And so what we're looking at here are each orange dot is a hip camp uh, post, is a, is a place that you can experience and stay at within hip camp. And if you look at the arrows, what we're seeing here are the migratory paths of the monarch butterflies. And so we have spring and summer, as you see in the blue and the white. And if you look at where those migratory paths overlap the orange dots, that tells us that monarchs are existing, thriving, using your properties, are using the places that you steward, are using the places that you care for and you protect. And so this tells me that HIPCAM has a unique opportunity to influence the, the future of monarchs. I mean, look at, look at the overlap. You have this Eastern seaboard migratory route that runs up the Appalachian Mountains into the Northeast. We have a ton of dots, a, a huge abundance of dots that are looking at the California coast where monarchs overwinter. I mean, to me, this is extreme opportunity. This could not be more exciting because again, if we can join forces and get our heads focused on protecting monarchs, there is an incredible opportunity to help save them because as we learned, they're on the brink. Monarchs are, migratory monarchs are endangered and they need our help. And so as we look further into this, uh, this webinar today's discussion, I'm really excited to, for a light to be shined on the question marks you see on the slide down in Mexico, because for the longest time, it was a mystery. Once the monarchs left our backyards, once they left our working lands, once they left our native prairies, where did they go? How does this incredible, hardy, magnificent insect make a living in this world? And where do they spend their lives? And luckily we have the man to answer that question for us, and that's Phil. And so I'll be passing the mic over to him. He has some of the most incredible stories about adventures in this part of the world. And as a butterfly expert, He'll be the one to hopefully uh, fill in some of those blank spots uh, on the map. So, Bill, thank you so much for being here and take it away. 
So happy to be here. Um, that was a great map. I mean, if it, just every single one of those dots you see as an opportunity. And if you can imagine a butterfly flying over North America, they need more dots. We're gonna, I'm going to get a little bit into that. Um, first, just want to introduce myself. My name is Phil Torres. I've been obsessed with butterflies since I was six years old. Um, I became an entomologist, but through doing expeditions around the world and um, discovering new species and doing all those adventures, I became more of a science storyteller. So now I have a show on Discovery Channel. I do a lot on Instagram. Um, I have a pretty good time. Um, just moved to this area here. We're north of Seattle just over a year ago. And so this is my little conservation project. And my biggest enemy here is invasive ivy. That's what I spend a lot of my time pulling ivy and replacing it with native plants. Um, and I do a little bit of triage. And I think a lot of you need to think about what you can realistically do to help your environment. So the triage I do here is Ivy, when it's on the ground, yes, it, it covers the ground, which isn't ideal, but when it climbs trees, it does two things. One, it can take down these big, beautiful Douglas firs behind me. And two, the ivy only flowers and creates seeds um, and fruit that birds spread when it climbs up. So by cutting these big vines, it uh, basically stops that ivy from spreading to a new location and it protects the trees. So I spend a lot of my time with big clippers going through the local parks and just going rogue and why not? I mean, it, it helps the local environment. So I just go for it. Um, but uh, yeah, one of the things I replace it with here are native berries. It's really rewarding when you see that by making your ecosystem more productive for native species, you also are making it more productive for yourself in a way. So I have a lot of these berries out here, all these different huckleberries and gooseberries and native blackberries, which are a delicious, but B also many of them happen to be host plants of native butterflies. So I get berries and I get butterflies. And that term host plants basically means what can that butterfly lay its eggs on? Some species are very, very specific. They can only lay it on a you know single species. Others are more generalist. They can lay it on a few, but the more in your yard, the better. So let's get to the monarch. Um, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the extraordinary life of the monarch butterfly. I think it's really important to know a species that you are trying to help and, and really know it and be able to kind of think like that species and really embrace what it is that they have to go through in order to just survive. So let's start with the egg. Um, which came first, the butterfly or the egg? Well, in this case, let's, let's talk about the butterfly that's laying the egg. The female will fly around. She uses her big antenna up front to basically sniff the air. And what is she sniffing for? Milkweed. Milkweed is that host plant that monarchs need. Uh, Matthew's going to get it into all the different native species that each of you will have in your region and how you can plant those and um, create a little habitat. So they're sniffing for milkweed with their antenna, and then they land on a milkweed and they taste that milkweed. How do they taste it? They use their feet. Yes, these butterflies have little taste buds on their feet, and they're basically saying, hey, is this milkweed healthy? Are there other eggs on this one? Um, if it looks like a good one, the female will lay an egg on the underside of a leaf. That is something that, since I was seven years old, was just obsessed with. I grew up in Colorado. I would just walk the prairies looking for milkweed, flipping leaves over, trying to find these little singular eggs. And then you know, okay, I can come back to that next week and see what caterpillars grow in there. Um, Pretty amazing thing. So a tiny little caterpillar will hatch out of that egg. Its first meal will be its eggshell. And then this battle between milkweed and monarch begins. So we know that monarchs need milkweed for their caterpillars to grow, um, but milkweeds kind of really hate monarchs. Um, it's this interesting relationship that you see a lot in nature where milkweeds don't really like to be eaten right if you're a plant you want to just do your own thing you don't want to be chewed on so they have a bunch of defense strategies so one of their defense strategies is that milk in that name milkweed so they produce this latex and if you are a monarch caterpillar you have a pretty rough life because 60 percent of caterpillars their first bite of milkweed they're going to get so much latex in their mandibles that they die. 
So 60% of caterpillars die in their first bite. So yes, rough life as a monarch caterpillar. Um, and that's not the only defense that the milkweed has. It also has these toxins card called cardenolides. Uh, those are heart toxins. If you and I ate milkweed leaves, we would probably have a heart attack. So I don't recommend it. Um, but monarchs have evolved this term called sequestration. They basically take that toxin and they absorb it. And I'll tell you a little bit about, um, I have a real monarch caterpillar here. Okay, this is uh, a friend of mine crocheted this for my daughter, who is uh, not quite this big yet, but she will learn to love this. This is a real life-size monarch caterpillar. Okay, the real one is about this big, but this is what it would look like. And look at these really bold colors. So we know the monarch has that really bold coloration of orange and black. Well, in nature, that's usually telling predators something. That is a very strong signal to say, don't eat me, I'm toxic. The caterpillar has this same really vibrant stripes that is a visual symbol to predators to say, don't eat me. Why? Because they are toxic. How do they get that toxin? By eating the milkweed, absorbing it, bringing it into their um, into their body, into their whole system. And then that caterpillar is able to keep those toxins in even when it becomes a monarch itself. So um, a caterpillar is basically a glorified mouth, tube, and a butt. All they need to do is eat and eat and eat. Um, they basically need to grow the entire time. And um, it's one of the most important stages of a butterfly's entire life, because that's really where uh, it's at its most risk to survive because wasp will eat it. Um, the plant itself is trying to kill it, all that kind of thing. So throughout the summer there and throughout North America, there's typically four or five generations that go like this. You have the egg, caterpillar, butterfly, egg, caterpillar, butterfly keeps going until we get to the fall. And then the fall, something happens. And what happens is the caterpillars kind of detect that, okay, the photo period, the amount of light that happens in a day is getting lower. The temperature is getting a little bit colder and the food, the milkweed that they're eating is getting a little bit worse. It's not quite as good as it used to be. So what do they do? They eat more and they get a little bit bigger and that creates the super generation. I think that's one of the best names. Every once in a while in science, you're like, that's a really dumb name but every once in a while you're like that's a great name it's called the super generation and these butterflies that form they are a little bit bigger the super generation they store more fats they pause all the reproductive organs they say let's not focus on that right now why because they have this giant journey to do so i want to show you a butterfly in the super generation um i used to live in new york city and what was frustrating there is, yes, we have Central Park, but the majority of parks there are either grass and non-native trees or they are concrete. So it's so rare to find a little park that has some flowers. But where I lived in Soho, there's this little park called Elizabeth Street Garden. Um, it's actually at risk right now of being developed, but there's been people there fighting saying, hey, we need this garden and nature needs this garden. So take a look at um, let me share my screen here. A butterfly in the super generation. Um, how do I play this? Sorry, must be hidden. There we go. Okay, so this is in Elizabeth Street Garden, middle of New York City. And this butterfly, this monarch is going to town. It is prepping for its journey. So the average monarch, when they migrate, they will come from as far north as Canada. Some of the populations will migrate just from a place like Ohio or Texas, but they're all doing this journey south. On average, it's about 1,800 miles, okay? 1,800 miles. It takes them about two months to do this journey. So if you think about the amount of energy that it takes for a butterfly to fly, 1,800 miles, it needs a lot of nectar. So yes, we've talked about milkweed, um, but we also need to talk about nectar along the way and making these pollinator gardens that are really valuable fuel up stations for monarchs on their big journey south. Um, 
I also wanted to add, I, re, I forgot to mention that with milkweed, um, the opportunity there to replace habitat that has been lost, take a look at a place like Iowa. Um, I think right now the amount of native habitat there, so Iowa is a, a really important flyaway for monarchs, but they have less than 0.1% of their native prairie left, less than 0.1%. All of that is now crops essentially and so if you're a monarch flying over that area you are really desperately looking for a place to a lay eggs for your milkweed but b look for a place to fuel up like this garden right here and i want you to guess how many milkweed plants scientists think we are short of like how many do you think we need a plant to help bring back the population do you think it's you know a hundred thousand plants do you think it's a million plants hundred million Scientists think we need to plant about 1 billion, with the B, milkweeds to help bring back this monarch population. So we have a lot of planting to do. Thankfully, they're native species, so they're a little bit easier to grow, but uh, we got to get to it. So where do all these butterflies fly? These monarchs fly when they fly south. It's a place I go in Mexico, I try to go every single year to see it because it's just truly spectacular. It is um, at about 10,000 feet elevation. They navigate via these kind of compasses within their head. And somehow all of these millions of butterflies fly throughout North America and end up in this same patch of forest year after year after year. And I wanna show you a little bit of what it looks like when you're there. So how spectacular is that? Um, it's truly one of the most magical places on the planet. If any of you get an opportunity to go visit there, it's just three hour drive outside of Mexico City. It is really, uh, I mean, it's, it's life changing. It's incredibly motivating. And one of the things that hits me when I'm there is take a look at this video. And this is a tree trunk and branches entirely covered in butterflies. When you're there, you're surrounded by about 7 million butterflies per acre. So when you look around, that's about 7 million. There's about 100 million, between 30 and 100 million per year that end up in these areas. And look at, I want you to look across the screen and just choose a butterfly to observe and see what it's doing. And now imagine that butterfly's journey. Yes, they all ended up here, but one of those butterflies could have come from Texas, one could have come from Ontario, could have come from Massachusetts, but all of them somehow survived this 1800 mile journey south. And along the way, you, I can guarantee a huge amount of the butterflies that you're seeing here stopped in the land of people's backyards, stopped in the land of hip camps. And Every one of these butterflies, it's, it's really hard to make that flight. So if you can provide a little safe haven or a big safe haven for these butterflies to be able to stop, fuel up, continue that journey when they're going south or when all these butterflies return north to finally find a little patch of milkweed that they can lay eggs in, that is huge. Each one of you has an opportunity to contribute to one of these individual butterflies journey that is one of the most remarkable journeys in all of nature and it happens right here in North America. So I think we should all feel really, really fortunate that we get to experience this. If you're in California, this happens on a much smaller scale, but um, still you go to some of those areas in um, like Monterey, California, I've been and seen some of those overwintering grounds. It's, it's really amazing. The really endangered population out there, very similar ways of protecting them by planting natives and planting milkweed. So um, again, just it's so hard not to be inspired when you see something so beautiful. So I encourage you get out there. Um, Matthew's got some great info coming up on how we can 
preserve these guys. Sorry, let me get back to Zoom here. Um, how we can preserve them and uh, really get into the nitty gritty of what you can do. So um, I guess, I don't know if anybody else wants to hand it over to Matthew, but this guy comes from the Xerxes organization. It is like, I'm obsessed with them because they're the biggest invertebrate or um, conservation organization in North America. I grew up loving the little guys, the beetles and the bugs and the butterflies, and that's what they really work hard to protect. And so let's dig in. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Phil. That was quite, I mean, truly amazing. And I've seen some of the comments coming in. I'm like, yeah, those, those sites just be surrounded by um, just such an, a, an amazing abundance and such beauty is, is quite astonishing. Um, yeah, after that, I mean, I'm, I feel I'm a bit like, like, like the teacher in the room now. I'm going to like share my screen and show you some words. And it's not, not quite as inspirational, but um, I'm moving on to um, hopefully this will work. Um, have I done it wrong? Ah. Hopefully everybody can just, just see my screen now um, with the, the notes on it. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm, I'm moving on and I'm gonna um, talk a, a bit about milkweeds. Phil was telling you just the importance of the milkweeds. I also have a section on um, how to fuel that migration um, and then a, a third section about some of the things that you can be doing just, I mean, in the summer, part of what we should be doing is being outside and enjoying it um, and seeing what's going on. Um, so, I mean, the, this first question is, we know we need milkweeds for, for, the, for the caterpillars, um, but there's always the question of which is the right type of milkweed and which is the wrong type of milkweed. Um, the right type of milkweed, the simplest answer is you want the native milkweeds and the one that's appropriate for your region. And there are overall approximately 70 species of milkweed that occur in the United States and North America. Um, and some of them are widespread and some of them are really localized, um, but it's, it's important to try and track down um, which, which your local species are. Um, there's also the wrong type of milkweed. Um, and this is tropical milkweed also known as blood flower or scarlet milkweed, or some, sometimes it's referred to as Mexican butterfly weed. And it is native to North America, but only to the tropical part of North America and Central America. Um, and the real problem with it is, yeah, milkweed, I mean, sorry, monarchs will, will eat it and that they will, they will be happy to eat it and they'll face all the same struggles. You know, that 60% of the caterpillars will die on the first bite, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the real problem with this milkweed is that it can support um, the life cycle of a parasite of the monarch butterflies. And that parasite is a real problem. Um, and the tropical milkweed, the reason it supports the parasite is that it is an evergreen milkweed. Um, and so it, it stays green um, through the year instead of dying back like, like other the native species. And because of that, the parasite can remain on the, the plant. And then as the caterpillar grows and eats, it absorbs the parasite. And that parasite is then passed on all the way through to the adult stage. Um, so it's, it's the wrong type. I mean, it, it's widely available. It's beautiful and easy to cultivate. But it's the wrong type of milkweed to be growing. Um, I wanna focus on, on California, which was kind of the starting point for all these, these discussions that led to these workshops. Um, and it is a state where we have overwintering sites um, as well as breeding habitat. And that's a little, little complicated for, for, for managing for the monarchs because we know that around the wintering sites, we it's better to not plant milkweeds um, because you don't want the milkweeds there that will help break the, the dormancy, the breeding dormancy of the overwintering monarchs. Um, and so at a very simple level, and you can look on this map, if you're in, in um, on, on the coast of Southern California, basically from about Santa Barbara South, um, try and avoid milkweeds within one mile of the coastline. 
which is the coastline is the, the area where the, the um, overwintering sites are. And if you're in central California from um, Santa Barbara north to um, about Humboldt County, um, the brown stretch of coastline there, try to avoid planting milkweeds if you're within five miles of the coastline. And then if you're north of that on the coastline, milkweeds are fine because there aren't any, um, any overwintering sites that, that we're aware of along that zone. And just in case you're wondering that the reason why the overwintering sites are along the coast, it's not that the butterflies are seeking out warmth, as you would have guessed from the 10,000 foot in the mountains in Mexico. Um, they're seeking out cool conditions and stable conditions. And so, you know, the San Francisco Bay, for example, renowned for its fog and its, and its chilly summers, um, it's those, those cool conditions in the winter that the monarchs are chasing. Then once you're away from the coast, it, it is a little easier that there's not so much of a concern about not planting milkweeds, but we know that one of the most important things from um, studying the migration is the milkweeds in that first zone when the monarchs leave the overwintering sites. And they're leaving the overwintering sites and starting out in February and beginning to spread out across um, California's coast range and the Central Valley and then further beyond that. And so the area is pale blue on this map. It's early season milkweeds and then the dark blue area, um, any milkweeds. And if you're wondering what makes an early season as opposed to an any, here are four milkweeds that are really good for California. Um, from left to right, the California milkweed found in the southern half of the state and it's one of the earliest growing and earliest flowering milkweed. So that's a really good one for the early season. Similarly, the woolly pod milkweed, um, again, another one for the southern half and some parts in the north coast. And that's another early one. So that, that will be growing in, in February and March and beginning to flower in April. And then the other two milkweeds are much more widely spread. You've got the showy milkweed, which you find in the northern half of the state, and the narrow leaf milkweed, which you can find across all of California. And those two are, are ones that grow later and, and bloom later in the year, um, May and in, into June. So those are, those are all really good native milkweeds for California. Moving on from, from California, um, it, it's, it's much harder to be so specific, um, but here are some milkweeds that are really widespread. And if you're looking for milkweeds, not only are these widespread, but they're relatively easy to grow and they are widely available from um, plant nurseries, which is good. Um, the showy milkweed, again, this is one that isn't just limited to, to California, but it's a West Coast um, plant through the Rockies. You've got swamp milkweed, which will take you from the Rockies all the way across to the Atlantic. Um, and then the common milkweed, again, you know, all that spread across the eastern states, Great Great Plains, um, and through to the East Coast, but it's in the northern tier. So you probably, um, you know, from about Georgia northwards. Um, and then the very well-known butterfly milkweed, the bright orange one that you will get anywhere across the eastern states. So these are all really good um, milkweeds to be growing. And if you want more information about which milkweeds are specific for your region, if you go to the Xerces website, you can find, uh, we have a series of these regional guides um, for you know, um, all, all the regions of the US. And if you do get there and check this out, don't be surprised um, that it says roadside habitat on them. That just reflects the grants we had that allowed us to create these, these guides, but the actual information is relevant to any, um, any land in those regions. I'm gonna move on now to fueling the migration, as Phil was saying, providing nectar to, to keep these monarchs flying for the, for the 1800, if they're coming all the way from Ontario, 3,000 miles. Um, and, you know, they, they can fly a reasonable distance in a day, I mean, tens of miles in a day, but that still means that they're going to be stopping and stopping and stopping. Um, and so we need to be trying to um, pepper the landscape with good nectar plants. And for, for this, for the return migration, the fall migration, we really need late season blooming flowers. Um, here's a selection of some flowers that, that you might find um, blooming late in the summer and into the fall across 
um, the United States from essentially from west on the left hand side to east on the right hand side. Um, rabbit brush, fireweed, sunflowers. This is an annual sunflower, but sunflowers of all sorts are just fabulous nectar. Um, and the bottom there, the, the um, um, blazing star. Again, I mean, it's, there's there's one plant called the Rocky Mountain Blazing Star, which is from the northern states, and it's some, sometimes known um, or ha, 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 has been called monarch cracker cane because if you've got them there, they'll just be obsessed with it. And you know, the the, the nurseries growing this plant for seed find their fields are just covered with hundreds and hundreds of of monarchs every season. Um, and then the yellow plant here at the top is goldenrod. There are lots of regional goldenrods, well established as a, as a late season plant. Um, purple cone flower, asters, and mist flower. And so that's just a very quick um, summary of, some, of just to, to give you an idea of, of some of the great plants that are out there. I want to pause a little bit for native thistles because thistles are frequently just seen as weeds to be pursued and dug out and destroyed. Um, and there certainly are some problematic non-native invasive weed thistles like Canada thistle and, um, and bull thistle and milk thistle. Um, and they might be fabulous in nectar, but they have all sorts of other problems. And in the process of, get, of controlling those thistles, our native thistles have been suppressed as well. Um, and there are native thistles and they are a fabulous source of nectar late in the summer. Um, in fact, some of our native thistles such as tall thistle is actually a preferred stopping point and nectar point for monarchs. Um, so if you have a place in, in your landscape, if you're developing a meadow and you can include thistles, it's one to be recommended. And as with the, the, the milkweeds, um, Xerces, we also have a series of regional um, plant lists that will guide you to the best nectar plants for the fall season um, for, for your region. So that information is there for you to dig into um, in greater detail. And I just want to um, wrap up with a few slides just to give you an idea of, you know, here we are, we're moving into the high summer, we're, you know, we're going to be surrounded by hopefully surrounded by flowers and insects of all sorts. So this is a, a great time of the year to, to, to sit back and enjoy what you've got. Take in the flowers, the monarchs, bees, butterflies, the other insects, et cetera, et cetera. But while you're out there enjoying it, um, it's also good to take notes. And this, and this is one, one great thing about um, smartphones. Um, you know, you've got apps that you can identify flowers, you can take photographs of flowers or insects, you can keep notes on your phone. So it's phones have become a really valuable tool for the gardener now. Um, and then while you're out there, you know, take notes of which flowers do you have blooming and, and what, what time are they blooming? Which, which plants are the insects visiting? Which plants are growing well and which plants aren't growing well in, in your landscape? Um, you can also be looking for the gaps that you might have in your landscape. You know, I mean, physical gaps, are there places where you can add flowers um, or um, time gaps? You know, do you have periods of the summer when you don't have flowers in bloom? Um, how do these compare to times when you see monarchs in, in your region? Do you have a diversity of flowers? Do you, do you have the native milkweed and do you have those late blooming um, flowers. I just, I mean, these, these photographs here are, are gardens, may or may not look like, like your landscape, but they illustrate some of these points. That top, top photo, it's a beautiful garden, it's got lots of native plants, it's pretty drought, drought resi resilient for the, the, um, the, the heat of the California, but if you look at it, it's got almost no bloom in it at the time, which means that even if you did have butterflies flying through, they're not going to stop because there's no nectar. Um, and the bottom one, full of bloom, but it's all one species and it's a non-native species. So, you know, it's a really limited resource um, as, as the, the butterflies view it. In fact, the, all these photographs were, came from just a couple of blocks from um, this, this garden on the lower left here. 
And this is the garden where all the monarchs are in the neighborhood. And where if you want to see monarchs, you know that you can go to these folks' garden because they're full of native plants plus milkweeds. And then when, when you've thought about what you've got and what you haven't got, now is just also a good time to think about um, what flowers you can add. You know, can you be adding um, those, those late season plants that, that you're not seeing? Um, checking out the plant list to find out what the possibilities are, what would be good plants to add. And also it's worth looking around um, to find out what local native plant suppliers you have um, and to find out what, what they have. Because there, there's a difference between um, seeing a plant on a list and going, wow, I want that, and then actually being able to get it. So it's, it, there's always these, these practical constraints playing in too. And then one other thing to consider when you're, you're looking for plant suppliers is that a lot of plants grown and that you see in plant nurseries, um, in the growing process, they've been treated with insecticides, such as the neonicotinoids that are so widely known now. Um, and although you may be you know, a pesticide free or an organic gardener or land manager, um, and so what's in your garden is safe. It, one of the unfortunate things is that bringing plants in, you can be bringing in some unsafe chemicals and contamination in, into your landscape. So it's worth going to the nurseries and, and talking to them to find out how the plants are grown. And sometimes this, this means it puts a bit of effort into tracking down local suppliers because frequently the small local growers are the ones who are growing um, with minimum pesticides. And there's the neonicotinoids, the neonics that I watch out for. But of course, now we're moving into neonic replacements and we have some more things Things that I can't pronounce, such as clopyridiferone and cy cyantranilipolarol. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not sure if the manufacturers do this to give them complicated names just to make it difficult for people asking questions, um, but uh, we have to be aware of these things. And then the last thing I want to touch on um, is if you do have places the way you think you can be planting now is a good time to start thinking about site preparation um, it can be a long process and depending on on the um the technique you want to use to prepare it it can take months um maybe even as long as a year um, but if if you have a place and you know it doesn't have to be a big place but maybe you've got a spot where you, you think you can put in a garden now is a good time to start prepping and planning for that because one way of controlling weeds and clearing to so say you have the bare ground is just by tilling multiple times um, you can also solarize um, covering it with plastic sheeting, which heats the ground sufficiently to kill off the, the weed seeds and weed plant and, and create a really clean um, uh, planting area. So there are lots of different ways to do it. Um, and you may also need to get into these stock, stock treatment of, of noxious weeds like, like Canada thistle or, or bull thistle. Um, and there are ways to do that. You, you can flame treat, you, there are, um, uh, vinegar based um, herbicides you can use or you just just dig them up if, if it's not too much effort um, and with that I will hand it all over I'll stop sharing and hand it back to Charles. Matthew thank you that was an amazing overview of, of pollinators and what we can do with that mindset to benefit monarchs um, on the land and thinking more about their biology and their beloved uh, milkweed. And so I think, you know, we had some more time. We, we certainly have just a bunch of incredible questions that I'm sure the uh, panelists and myself have noticed. Um, but before we maybe dive into the q and I, I have a few questions that I'd love to ask Matthew and Phil, and, and maybe if, if Phil or Matthew, you have questions for, for me or for Phil, maybe spend a few minutes just kind of, kind of having a little round table covering um, questions that remain in your mind or topics that we could we want to flesh out a little bit further. Um, the first thing that comes to, to my mind, Matthew, is, is Roundup, glyphosates. This is something that is, you walk into a Home Depot or your garden store and it's often right there as your kind of Swiss Army Knife solution for weeds. How do we get around that? I mean, I know that depending on the amount of land you have under your management, you know, you're, you're running, you know, cattle on a, on a, on a a larger operation or you're a backyard gardener, costs involved, times involved, there's like a whole entire calculus that has to be respected as we make land management decisions. But 
do you have a thought on how we navigate that, how we get around that, how we um, try to be effective and also practical? Yeah, uh, and yeah, it's that that practical that's that's a real challenge because I mean, weed control, particularly control of noxious weeds, and you know, um, Phil was talking about his English ivy. I mean, that's a that's a real problem for the forests um, around towns and in, in in the kind of the maritime northwest. Um, but you can go anywhere, and you will find real problem weeds, um, yellow star thistle in California. Um, there are, you know, I, there, is, there are so many that, that are problematic. Um, and if they're not spread too far, then you can treat them, spot treatment and, and, you know, focus on getting rid of them before they spread too far. Um, there are ways to, do that without herbicides at all. I mean, physical ways you can you can dig them up. Um, as, as a young conservationist, I used to spend weeks of my summer digging up thistles on um, conservation grasslands in, in England, for example. Um, that just became the thing. In fact, if you, the, the, this new monitor, remember, was um, Dig in May, back the next day, dig in June, back too soon, dig in July, they're bound to die. Um, and the idea is that if you're if you're cutting them off or digging them up at the right time of year, then you you let them put all their effort into, into growing. And then just as they're about to start reproducing, <laughs> you dig them up and they're like, I oh, can't cope and they die. Um, and then there are other ways you can flame um, weed with, it's not quite a flamethrower, but I mean, it is a, a flaming torch that you can go in and, and treat some of these things. Um, and then there are, if you're looking to clear out uh, a, a, um, an area because you want to plant a meadow, say, and you need to get a good seed bed, then there are a variety of um, organic methods that you can use. Um, there's the solarization with plastic that in we, we, we've been trialing this and if people really want to dig more deeply into this you can go to our website and there is a um, a guide to organic site preparation there um and so you know there are these these ways of, of doing that solarization with plastic tilling multiple times um smothering with cardboard and organic mulch um, you know, there, there are various ways of doing it, but all of those have advantages and disadvantages, you know, certain conditions where they won't work. Um, and most of them are limited to fairly small areas. Um, and so if, and a lot of this comes down in the end to the decision of the landowner. I mean, if, if someone wants to create five acres of meadow, um, and I mean, we've worked with some people and they've done 50, 60, 70 acres of meadow. And there's no way that you can cover that with plastic or you know, mulch it with, with cardboard. Um, and so the, the, there are occasions when glyphosate or some other weed killer may be the only practical alternative to achieve the longer term ends. And it, it is, you know, it's a balance. You know, you, you do this once one year of treatment for long-term benefit. Um, and the real impact of glyphosate is when it's used again and again and again, year after year after year on an agricultural land to control weeds in, in farm landscapes. Um, and that, that's where the concentrations build up and the reapplication. Whereas if it's, if it's a, single, a single year of application, then, you know, balancing, maybe that is the, the right balance. But again, that, that's the big project. You know, the smaller project, which may be what most people are taking on, there are effective ways of avoiding. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think for the next webinar um, that we will be sharing with yeah. more information soon, we really hope to dig into some of those larger landscape mm -hmm. questions and kind of conundrums as we think about best practices. Yeah, because yeah, if you're in a garden, you just have to get your hoe out, you know? I mean, there's there's no better way than that. Just hands and knees. I mean, I, that, that's how I manage my garden. Um, I have I have hoeing, I have a hoe, I have a weed puller and I have knee pads. Um, and sometimes it's tedious, but I actually really enjoy it. 
because it, it's so different from my work, although it's also related to my work because I'm out there and I'm surrounded by flowers and insects and I'm thoroughly engrossed by, by what I'm discovering as I, as I go, um, as well as knowing that, that I can manage my, my, my own garden with minimum impact. And Phil, I've been, I've, I follow you on Instagram. I've been watching your land stewardship adventures in the backyard. You know, something that I want to be also mindful of is that everybody who's participated in this webinar <clears throat> got a different, different chapter in their, in their pollinator stewardship journey and creating a space, a pollinator garden habitat. This takes time. This isn't necessarily going to be something to do this weekend. Monarchs show up you know, you have your champagne and move on. Talk to us a little bit about kind of the long game, right? You're really investing in this, in this adventure, in this journey. And talk to us the mindset and just, and maybe some of the tips and tricks that you've adopted to really start this journey at, at your new place. So I, I really want to encourage people that even starting small makes a big difference. Um, having lived in New York City, walking around there you know sometimes we walk 10 miles a day it's just that's what you do there and, and every time i'd see a tiny little you know even windowsill with flowers or a little stoop that had a tiny little flower bed if you look there i would see native bees i would see native butterflies i would see these native species that come and say this is a little safe haven for me this is a refueling space and those are tiny but they add up across north america so I think as you're getting to know your land, if this is your first time really getting into it, um, I think it's okay to really look at it on a year by year basis, like Charles, was, like you were just saying, where it's, uh, you're still figuring out your techniques. I think I've been doing native planting here in the Seattle region for, I think this is my third summer. And finally this spring was when I was like, okay, I kind of get what works here, what works in the different shady spots in my yard. So I went big and I went to the native plant sales that they have in this region, got a bunch of them and have been working on that. And I I look at these little plants that I've put out there and, and covered with wiring to keep the rabbits from eating them. And I'm like, I, I see them small now, but I'm looking towards that future in three years and five years when these things have really, really established themselves. And I have this amazing meadow of I'm planting these big vanilla leaf things that smell like vanilla and they're that big and it's replacing all the ivy that's there and so I, I like to just kind of dream of what it's going to look like in the future and I'm one of those weirdos that will go look at my plants every day and be like how you guys doing you know you need water the rabbits keeping you alone or the slugs that come at you and that's a really good way of just getting to know your nature as well see who's visiting see what's eating them. Sometimes there's good things eating them. Um, sometimes there's bad things eating them. So rabbits are not native to here. They're not ideal, but um, the banana slugs are native to here. So it's fine. And then lots of times you'll see these little crescents, these little like half moons cut out of leaves. And that means that it's native bees, these leaf cutter bees. So I think going to check in on, on these things and, and taking it small your first year to kind of you know, I do little testing grounds around to see what works best and, and what kind of light. Mm -hmm. And then your instincts will really start to kick in and then you can go bigger year after year. But I, I think even if you start small, you will notice that within that first year, there are native species visiting those flowers, visiting that milkweed, and that you've made that little bit of a difference that can turn into a much bigger difference over time. I love that. I mean, we lived in Montana for three years. We had um, 10 acres of orchard grass, non-native, no pollinator habitat in sight. And you're pulling up the driveway, taking native plants out of the car, and there's native bees on the flowers as I'm walking them into- Oh my gosh. You know, wow. and so they say, build it and they'll come. And so, so one other question before we really jump into Q&A is because I'm just watching so many great questions popping up here. You're a science, Phil has a, Discovery Channel show. He's a professional. One of the things that I think hip camp hosts are so uniquely positioned to do in a way um, that others are not is to expose people to pollinators, to introduce people to monarchs, to be that conduit, that vehicle, that portal into nature. And so when you talk about nature, Phil, it's contagious. Do you have any, like, what are the three things that a, a host is listening or watching 
if they were going to introduce one of their hip campers to monarchs to pollinator habitat, what are one, two, three things that you would say, like, this is what you should touch on. It's exciting. It's cool. It'll hook them. So I'd say first off, get them to ask the questions. Um, one of the best ways to do that. One of the first things that we have when we walk, people walk into our property, there's a sign that says certified wildlife habitat. That is something that people will see and they'll be like, oh, like, what does that mean? It, it looks great, obviously. And that, that gives you this, you look around, you're like, oh, that's a cool thing. So putting little signs saying, um, and you can get a certified wildlife habitat that is a, a national thing that you can do. Um, but you can also make your own sign saying like there's a monarch waste station or pollinator habitat. Um, little things that get them curious to stop and say, oh, this what I'm looking at right here is special. And that gives them the opportunity to come to you and ask some questions. Um, I also think if I, I don't know how it always goes, but if you get an opportunity to meet and greet them, if you are checking on your garden regularly, that gives you the chance to say, oh, I know where there are monarch eggs right now. I can go flip this leaf and say, hey, this is growing right here. This thing is going to turn into a caterpillar, which is going to turn into a monarch, and it's going to keep going on its journey. Um, so getting to know your land and getting to know the little creatures around and getting people to appreciate like, oh, this place that I'm about to camp, that I'm about to get closer to nature, isn't just big it's not just for the views the views obviously matter but these little details really make you know that everything around you right now is is special and you should kind of feel honored to be a part of nature and get to sleep outside and and really you know wake up next to these things i love that yeah that uh, that that hook of creator of curiosity having that sign which is a brilliant idea and xerces actually has signs that you know, just as Phil was describing, I also love the DIY approach. I mean, that's super fun. You can get custom, have to get the family involved, get hip campers involved, uh, a bit of a team effort. But yeah, I love that. Um, yeah. Um, the, other, the other thing I'll, I'll add is um, uh, seeds is something that are hard to come across. But if you have little packs of native um, seeds, there's a lot of wildflower seeds out there. The majority of what you can buy at the store are not native. So if you can find native ones and you send your hip camper home with a little pack of 15 seeds, um, you know that they're probably, especially if they're native to you, if they live around your area within you know, 100, 200 miles, which I imagine most hip camp guests will, um, that's a really good way of, of passing it on. And, and that's just the coolest going away gift. That's what we did at our wedding underneath everybody's plate. There was native milkweed seeds um Can so collect seeds? is that something that that somebody could do and 100 yes yeah. when when fall happens when you you'll see those big billowy plumes of of milkweed seeds that come out and they're they get blown away in the air but you can go in and collect all those seeds and the best way to store them is just stick them in your refrigerator these things need to have that cold stratification it's called basically winter tells these seeds that once they warm up they can start to grow so you can store them in your fridge, um, you can store them in bags outside and you can give those things away. And um, that's that's a really cool thing you can do too. And a single pod could have 200 seeds in it. So you could collect a thousand, 2000 seeds with not a ton of effort. I love that. Sending, sending them home with a little bit of your garden as well. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Matthew, I think- yeah, uh, I just wanted to throw in, um, following on from what Phil was saying, I mean, the great ideas and suggestions for, for what the host individually can do. Um, and I just wanted to say that the host, you don't have to feel like you know everything. Um, I mean, yeah, Phil's so right to say that this is a journey um, and, and what you can do a little bit each year and gradually transform because really that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to transform the landscape um, and that's not going to happen overnight. It's, it's a longer journey, but also for, you know, if you're a host sharing your, your, your land and your monarchs or your, I mean, you don't have to feel like, you know, everything before you start sharing. One of the most important things that I find in working with just getting people to stop and look, because too often people are going past and they're not seeing what's, what's there. Um, and if you get people to stop and look and to spend a little bit of time just taking in the diversity and, you know, if you're still, wildlife will come back to you as well. I love that. And just thinking about 
if there's four million acres approximately of camp working lands, imagine if you planted one milkweed per acre. That's four million milkweed plants, or even two. And so I think it's it's important to play the long game on your land, but also if you think about the long game as a community, that's massive. One milkweed a year per acre. I mean, quickly we're at 16 million, you know, and we scale up. So these these small drops, you know, make the sea. And I think that we're all, yeah, really well positioned to, to create a groundswell here. Um, so yeah, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Phil. Um, Remy, do you want, how do you want to jump into Q and A's? I think, I think you have maybe about 20 minutes left. Yeah, I'd be happy to um, read some out. I see some people have also raised their hands. So if you'd like to ask your question in person, you can use the little hand raise um, option there at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'll kind of switch between so that we can get um, some good coverage here. I think one of the first questions we had come through um, from Joanna was, is it okay to buy Monarch kits online or is it more sustainable to build the environment and let them come naturally? Um, Matthew or Phil, any thoughts there? Um, yeah, for me, um, it's much better to build the habitat and, and have them come naturally. Um, one of the amazing things about the monarch is that there is a, it's one of the few insects that I'm aware of that has a really enthusiastic following, you know, and there are people who, who dedicate their, you know, the, the, their time and energy to it. And sometimes that means that people are doing breeding in their backyard or in the kitchen counter or on the screen porch or whatever. Um, and there, there are some problems with that. Um, and again, it's similar with the tropical milkweed. It's this parasite that gets moved around and diseases. And so um, it's much better to, to not be, be breeding. Um, although it is this amazing experience of experience you know seeing the butterfly going through that life cycle from through the caterpillar the chrysalis the adult and so on um and so that i think there is a place for having a, a few butterflies you know five butterflies or whatever that 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 you um can can rear and and watch um and it's better to collect those locally um find the caterpillars or the eggs on 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 your own plants and then put them somewhere where you can observe them Awesome. There's also been some interesting science done on the navigation of mm -hmm. butterflies and how they know which direction they to go. And some of that navigational cues can actually happen at the caterpillar stage, they think, um, yeah. as far as orienting them within this continent of North America to end up in that one little patch of forest in Mexico. So they're they're a very mysterious creature i remember that was one of the things i loved about monarchs when i was a kid is i would look at them in my yard and say this is the most well-known butterfly in the world yet we still don't know so much about them and that really inspired me as a kid to become a scientist because there's just so many things to learn and that's one of the kind of confusing things that they're realizing is that where the caterpillar grows up also affects where the butterfly flies so keep that in mind. I, I don't recommend getting the kits, um, you know, or getting someone to deliver them to you unless they happen to be your neighbor, something like that. But again, that that idea, if you build it, they will come. If you put in these milkweed out there, you'll get you'll get monarchs. You'll, and, and not to mention that the flowers of milkweed are also great for other butterflies. They get swallowtails on them all the time, other spectacular visitors. So it's a good plant to put in overall. And Phil, one, one quick question that you can expand on. People might see, it might be rare, but they might see on a monarch win a U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Tour. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tell us about that. What, so what are that, we learning? What are we looking at? That's like the lotto ticket that when I'm down there in Mexico at the migration site, you will look at all these butterflies and the males actually will mate and then die there. So you, the, the ground will be covered in butterflies as well. And you look for these tiny stickers. Because it is a question, how the heck did anybody figure out where these butterflies fly? You can't follow a butterfly for 2,000 miles, uh, especially when they're flying you know, a mile in the air sometimes. So they would put little stickers on them, and there are these little tiny white tags that have a, a specific code number and a little website to go. Um, and so we found two of them in all my times going down there, and it's really cool. You collect the sticker from them. 
you send it in. I think uh, Monarch Watch is one of the ones that does it. Um, there might be a few other tracking things, but the information is on there. And so if you happen to see a butterfly with that, if you get a photo of them, um, you can basically help. And this is also something you can do. If you get really into raising butterflies and having them in your yard, you can be one of those people that put stickers on them. I remember one of the stickers that we found, we wrote the organization, ended up, it was some woman from, I think, South Dakota that raised butterflies in her yard um, or helped catch butterflies and put the sticker on them. And so it was one of the coolest things of her life, knowing that that butterfly that she put that little sticker on made its journey all the way to Mexico and someone found it again and was able to tell her, Hey, it, it, it arrived. So that's, uh, that's another aspect of the science that you can get into. Um, that's really fun and something that you can observe. That's great. Thanks for sharing. It brings me back to that picture of all those butterflies in Mexico, right? Like if you're in your backyard, at your hip camp and you see one of, that, one of those super generation monarchs, it's headed to Mexico. It's only gonna get there if it has backyards to fuel up, get charged and keep, keep moving. How much ground are these monarchs covering in a day? Um, I wanna say can be, I, I think Matthew, you had said it, it, it can be tens of miles a day. You know, if they catch a good wind, they can make it maybe 30, 50 miles in a day, maybe. But in general, it's it's much less. And so they they need to fuel up. And then also lots of times in, in some of these migratory pathways, like in up in Michigan, um, I've seen it where these trees will just be covered in monarchs because they also need time to rest a little bit and then wait for the conditions to be right, to be warm, some good thermals, bringing them up into the air. And they basically will will fly up and try to ride these thermals and then they'll glide. And then they'll fly up and try to ride these and then they glide. So that's where having those extra big wings just by a little bit gives them a little bit more surface area to glide. Amazing. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and allow someone who raised their hand. I'm going to click the allow to talk button. So Gail, if you're still with us and have a question you'd like to ask, I'm going to unmute, unmute you now. <laughs> All right, Gail, you can go ahead and click um, unmute if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. I'm hoping I'm not the only Gail and I apologize. I do this all day long. I do, we do teams and I guess I hit it. I am very sorry. It was just oh. being enthusiastic. No problem. Glad to have you here. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. <laughs> all right, um, then I will do Diane. It looks like you have your hand raised. <laughs> Let's see. All right, Diane, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you're welcome to ask your question. Looks like Diane Costco. Sorry, I think it was, I clicked it by accident. I had submitted oh. some other questions prior. No problem, then welcome to you as well. We'll go ahead and go back to the chat then. Thanks for joining us. That. That's fine. Okay, sounds good. So let's see here. Are there any flower species that grow in the shade or part shade that attract monarchs? Uh, Matthew or Phil? That's a mm, yeah, I, yeah um, none leaped to mind. Um, but that doesn't mean there aren't any. It just means that I can't think of one. And that's partly where, I mean, say we, we have these regional plant lists and so that's that would be my recommendation is to go check those um those the lists that we created are based upon sightings and observations <laughs> so it's like it, the, the plants in that really are the ones that that seem to support the the most monarchs during the migration and so yeah i guess it depends how shady you're talking um i mean monarchs themselves you wouldn't really see them flying through a shady forest. They like uh, butterflies often like forest edges or they like big open areas where there's, there's tons of sun, um, prairie, that kind of thing. So if you have a forest edge, then that's a great place to plant these things. Um, but if you're in a full shade environment, it probably isn't ideal, but that doesn't mean there's not a lot of other pollinators that you can be helping like native bees and, and other more shade loving species. Um, but even partial shade, like there, there's some um, milkweed that, that can grow in, in partial shade. So, uh, but that's, that's again, part of the journey is figuring out what grows in certain areas. And so 
Um, yeah, there's still things that can be done, but if you're in a full shade area, it may not be specifically for the monarch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I see Alyssa shared in the chat some of those pollinator friendly plant lists. So go ahead and click that if you'd like to learn more about um, your regional pollinator plants. Uh, Julie, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk. I see you wrote in the chat. So if you want to come off mute, you're welcome to do that. Am I good? Yep. Okay. Um, so we have, I live in Massachusetts, in central Massachusetts, and uh, we have a small backyard. And there is this thing that we found out was called mile a minute vine. And it's an invasive species and it's no joke. I mean, last year it literally came halfway across the yard. I mean, you'd, you'd clip it and you go out and it was, it's like the creature that never dies. So last year we did do, a, 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 we did use um, a, a weed killer on it. We, we, we got in in the fall and we pulled the crap out of it. And we're, <laughs> I'd really like to keep it uh, this year when I went out, I, I weeded it some more and because we had used the weed killer on it, um, the weeds did come, you know, they did, it did come up and other plants are, are tiger lilies and there's a few other things that are coming up. But I would like to know, I was interested in the thing where you said about heating with the, I'd like to know, is there any way to get rid of that sucker without having it really just, it really overtakes everything and I don't see any good use for it. Um, maybe there is something that, that can keep it from coming back besides just clipping the hell out of it every two days um yeah unfortunately i don't know mile a minute or, or maybe i should say fortunately i don't know mile a minute because it doesn't grow in my region um but i we i do deal with um blackberry invasive blackberries here and for that one um i clip them back um and then go back in and try and dig out the roots um okay. which is it, which is hard work um but again sometimes the, i mean sometimes these are the situations where um a herbicide of some kind is is helpful because if yeah. you if you cut it all the way back and then and then treat the root um and the, just the basal stems then you've got a much better chance of of being able to harm the the the, the growth and, and stop it from coming back and would you suggest, because last year we did it in the fall, because that just seems like a good time, but would you suggest trying to do that now when it's actually still trying to grow? Because you had said so, about July. Um, Julie, I was just did some quick um, Googling and uh, and <laughs> lots, of, lots of universities like Penn State has some great info on this. And one of the things that they were saying is that it's best to do it before June because the seeds aren't mature yet. Um, but once the seeds and the fruit are basically maturing all summer long, so they're they're spreading there throughout the summer. Um, but yeah, so I, I think ideally you'd want to do it next year in the spring is probably the, the best time if you're going to pull them. Um, and then there is a biological control agent. There's a weevil that you can get. Um, some nurseries will have certain things like that, that you can talk to them and say, hey, I've, I've got this problem. Um, and that is a basically an insect that will eat them and help keep it at bay. A weed um, full. <laughs> yeah. And then, so yeah, I would say, yeah, figuring out the right time of year. So I'd say spring is probably ideal. That's another thing that we deal with here with the ivy is we actually wait till after spring because the ivy is really thick and we get a lot of birds nesting in it. Uh, and so a lot of the efforts that my buddy here, who's a restoration ecologist, he waits until after most of the birds have, have fledged, then they get in there and take out all these things. So there's a lot of different factors to consider, but looking at university agricultural extension sites, that's usually a really good resource of just like plain and simple cut and dry sand. Here's the best time to take on that nasty weed. Super, and I see you put that, I know you're recording this. Is the chat gonna be in the recording as well? So we can click on those things later. Um, you know, I'm not sure about that, but what I can maybe do is send a, an email to the people who that participate. That would be great, right. because it's so hard to do. Anyway, th thank you for your help, because it's, uh, there's no bird's nest in these things. They're just these, they literally, yeah. look like they're living, uh, sentient beings coming across the yard. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for Thanks, your Julie. Uh, and um, another, another quick thing, too, is you know, there's also weed district um, offices, and I know in Montana, where I used to live, you can just call the local weed district. They'll send somebody out who's an expert. And they did a walk on my land. We had 10 acres, like I said, of pasture. And they did a walk and identified the noxious weeds and talked with me about the solutions that might be 
free uh, and then make available. So it's worth also looking into, into those um, resources, which just are a Google away, so. Thanks, Charles. Um, I had a couple of questions come in about this. What's the deal with butterfly bushes? Are they not good for butterflies? Um, so I, regionally, they are considered invasive species. They're, they're um, where I am, they're considered invasive. I think there's a lot of areas where basically they're realizing that yes, they are uh, good magnets for, for nectar for butterflies, but that's not all we need to look at when it comes to what a plant does in your ecosystem. A good plant is also eaten by native species. And so one of the issues is that it is a big dominant plant. It spreads really easily. Um, it's kind of spreading like a weed. And so when it's a magnet for um for butterflies and other things that's basically making the native flowers be ignored a little bit and it's it's growing in areas and mis and displacing the native species as well so that was something that growing up i used to plant and now i don't i i tearing it out of people's yards because the science has kind of come around to say it's not the best thing to plant. There's a lot of other species out there that are maybe a little bit harder to find, but that's where these these lists that Matthew's provided can be really helpful to get you started on that. But yeah, butterfly bush, I can't say I recommend anymore. Um, if you do have one in your yard and you really want to keep it, look out for other areas that it's starting to pop up and get rid of those. Um, and yeah, just be careful with it. Thank you. Um, you know, I think we maybe have time for one more. Um, where can people find seeds for their regional milkweeds? Local nurseries, or what would you suggest there? Um, the, the, um, yeah, there is a growing number of nurseries that can provide um, milkweed, either seeds or plants, and in some cases, the tubers, because it depends on the species as to which is the most efficient way or effective way of planting and growing them. Um, we, on the Xerces website, we do have a, a list of nurseries um, called the Milkweed Seed Finder, um, and you can go in and pull up a list of, of nurseries for different regions, states, etc. All right, I think that's a great place to find a great way to get resources for how people can start making some action on this and planting their milkweed. Um, I'm pretty sure almost all of these links were from Xerces. So thank you, Matthew, so much for you and Xerces, uh, you know, contributions there. Uh, if you have any questions, probably you can Google it and then put Xerces at the end and you'll probably find like a very specific resource for what you're looking for. Um, Anyways, I'm really happy that you all were able to join us today. I hope you all learned so much. I know I did. And um, if you've not already signed, please sign our Monarch Protection Pledge. Uh, we can go ahead and link that in the chat. Uh, keep, an, keep an eye out for our third webinar series where we're going to be talking about prepping your garden or your yard or your land for winter and fall. Um, and just kind of keeping that Monarch Oasis up and thriving. And with that, thank you all again so, so much for joining us. Uh, looking forward to webinar three. And if you have any lingering questions, feel free to email me at remi, R-E-M-I, at hipcamp.com. And I'll see if I can't try and track down an answer for you. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all at webinar three. Thank you so much.